Um, so, good to see everybody here, and thank you very much to Nick for um, allowing me to be part of this presentation. Uh, I feel very much um, that I need to stress actually the uncertainty principle, if you don't mind my saying, <laughs> which is that I must say there is doubt. And that is not only in relation to the fact that we could ever capture in one session the depth and complexity of 40 years of work in educational technology and the difficulty of trying to reconceptualize that in a very short space of time. I also want to stress, um, in fact, something that John Furlong said yesterday, Professor John Furlong, where he sort of said that we're always trying to help our learners face a world of uncertainty. Um, and I think there is that sense of uncertainty and difficulty around this issue and the fact that in some senses we're always struggling to catch up to know the past because in a way what is happening in technology and learning is so fast, is so rapid, is so massive and is happening all around us all the time as we speak that how we conceptualize it in any adequate sense is difficult. And I just want to kind of mention that, if you don't mind my saying, which is that I don't know everything. <laughs> and I argue that neither do any of us, actually. And so, in a sense, there is a limitation around what we are saying and speaking. And in the recognition of that, I actually think there is a need to create an umbrella-like framework. And in fact, as the speakers have said before, Diana and Colin and Nick, in terms of allowing some of the complexity of the field to emerge, I think there's a need for a recognition that in a journey of 40 years and looking forward to the future and the diversity, the mass nature of that, there is a need for, let's say, all-encompassing, quite open specifications. And in that sense, Redefining the field, I argue, is happening not just now as I speak, but is happening, I argue, in the next few months, shall we say, a year that it might take to actually adequately begin to answer this question, and that as we have then answered it in a year's time, we'll need to do it again. So there's a, there's a provisionality about what we are stating, and there's a provisionality, I think, which is necessary in the recognition, and this, I argue, is the nub of what our speakers have been saying. There is a little too much certainty, I'm afraid which has come forward in some specifications, shall we say, some research papers, whereby people sort of are sort of implying that actually they know it all, in the sense that I'm putting forward this little study which I've done, which is around PowerPoint in the classroom, and my learners said this, and that's that, you know? And I think there is a need, therefore, within our thinking about this field, to actually acknowledge that learning technology is a massive field and in that sense it's not just about tools and it's not just about systems but it's about humanity and it's about the framework of education itself. Now I draw us back really to think if educational technology in itself actually just kind of includes learning. So I rather prefer the term you know, kind of conservatively, I rather prefer the BJET term, which is British Journal of Educational Technology, because it, for me, it kind of is more encompassing than just learning. Now, that's, that's probably a daring statement to make it, and we can contest it. But within that, I wanted to say that of this knowledge map, um, in which if I, I, I'll give you the reference sort of thing, but it's basically a new map of knowledge-based on electronic data searches in journals in which users move from one journal to another to establish associations between um, different fields. And so it's actually a representation of user movements from one field of knowledge in one journal to another. So in that sense, I want to situate us within a vast field of complexity and to say that actually, um, if you look at education over here, and roughly represented in the purple would be statistics, computing, technology, and so on. We're looking also at social and personal psychology. We're looking at psychology, child psychology, and we're looking at cognitive science 
and so on, and a range of different areas immediately start to span out from the way in which we position this field within an emerging complex framework of knowledge. So I would argue within that immensity, and I can uh, point you to that as being a very, very interesting survey on clickstream data, which you might want to look at in terms of high resolution maps of science, um, and something that is actually being worked on at the present time. I wanted to argue that there is amongst the trends we're discussing an interdisciplinarity and a growing maturity of the field over 40 years, and that to point us to the emerging nature of something very important. Diana and I didn't talk before this seminar, I promise. But actually, I think what she's saying in terms of the design science for education is the nub of where um, the movement in terms of trends has been going for a long time. In 1999, when I completed my PhD at King's in computers and education, I came to the conclusion that design for learning was the most important thing that was emerging for me at that time in terms of the development of learning within the classroom. And so I want to point to that as being something that I think we really should explore within the new definition. The massive tape up of the web and the social media, the democratization and the explosion of knowledge I wanted to point to, alongside the emergence of neuroscience, the development of M learning, gaming, virtual worlds, you name it. Um, the inadequacy within that, I think we need to acknowledge, as Grania Canol has recently done in a number of her papers. Really, this um, the way in which traditional teaching methods just are not adequately capturing learners' needs. Connectivism within that and the development of new kinds of learning theories, participatory media and interactivity, I think point to the emergence of important new trends that we need to follow within BJEF. And so I would argue, and I come back to arguing, that the traditional framework of BJEF or educational technology and of kind of captures that rather well, I think, still. But there is a need for sharpening in terms of a recognition, for example, of worldwide trust in technology in a skeptical age. And I will point you to some data which actually looks at that, at how in a difficult and uncertain age, an age in which students and learners um, throughout the world, and I differentiate between students and learners in recognizing informal learning, which is, let's face it, most of the world is actually learning all the time in different contexts. And it's not just about learners in the classroom. As our previous speakers have noted, there's stuff going on all the time. We need to recognize not only learners in the classroom, but also, as Diana was saying, teachers, and I argue also managers, as Colin was arguing, as well as leaders in education, as well as, um, if you like, small businesses and so on. Informal learning right across um, many, many dimensions. So that worldwide trust in technology in a skeptical age is, I argue, something that's very interesting in this field. And that the emergence within that of new publishing models and open, open access models is something that we want to explore. Challenges. Now, Nick has mentioned, and Colin has mentioned, the difficulty around some of the papers, for example, that BJET is beginning to attract and other journals. I would argue that I don't think it's just an emerging trend. Having started as a learning technologist along, well, early 80s, I would argue that actually technolo technological determinism has been there for a very long time. Arguably, right since the beginning of the field, if not before, in terms of how we officially market. In other words, I think it's been a tools obsession for a very long time. Nothing wrong with tools. I'm fascinated by them as well. But I state, really, that the instrumentalist and policy-driven research questions that sometimes can occur relating to technological determinism do and can limit our field. And within that, an over-optimistic kind of 
sometimes, let's say, arguably government expectation around technology can be uh, difficult in terms of how we deal with an emerging and a complex field. Now, just continuing to look at challenges, I think really the kind of rather naive and limited research processes that can come from studies which are not really looking adequately at learning theory, I think has been a problem in the field that I have observed for a long time. Poor scholarship and low standards of writing, I think, is not, these are not unique to this field at all. But I have to say that um, I have noted, regrettably, some discussion around the low status of educational research, and I would like to argue against that and to say that we can and should be defining ourselves in a much more representative way. And that the inadequate understanding or definition of the discipline is something that is there as an opportunity to us, which today brings together. Nevertheless, if you look at that, so just to say that this um, very interesting data, which has emerged, um, and this is the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer. I'm not sure if you've seen the way that Edelman um, observes trust uh, across the world, but basically the data is collected across industries globally. What is very, very interesting for this field is that education, um, it, we're not looking at specifically at the moment, but we're looking at the technological emphasis in, in terms of trust of industries. Now, worldwide, technology um, for several years, and especially recently, has been number one rated in terms of the way that people actually, if you like, have faith in, have a trust in the way the technology is actually working. Now, I want to argue that that's actually a significant advantage to us, potentially. It could also be a disadvantage. So I think we need to be critical about how we apply that. But nevertheless, something very, very interesting, which is in, for example, um, in comparison with some other industries in the world, and the business-focused nature of this uh, is something that I would like to kind of highlight. For example, if we look at the kind of, well, <coughs> trust in banks actually um, is, is a little um, challenge, <laughs> let's say, at the moment. Um, but in terms of working with technology, I think we have, in a world which has been challenged by skepticism and by uh, a, an increase of distrust. If you look at the Edelman surveys, there's an increase of distrust in government right around the world, which is a very, very marked indication of a degree of uncertainty which is occurring in terms of traditional authority, which I think that we need to recognize um, as being both a difficulty and a potential advantage for us in a way. So trust in technology remains very high in all markets. Kind of quite interesting, just as a trend I note. And if we look, therefore, at a definition of educational technology which is inclusive, and those are just some of the trends, and I note here ICT and IT in education, as Colin notes, just one amongst the many fields that we should be encompassing. And I do agree with Colin in the sense that I think we have become too dominant, too dominated sometimes by ICT and IT. And I think there is a need to move beyond and back into some of the preoccupations that we've had in the last 40 years with, for example, technology enhanced learning, with educational media, with different kinds of technological uses. So I come to the point that if educational technology is concerned with thinking carefully about teaching and learning, as O'Shea and Self said many years ago, I think I was at King's at the time that they were writing that actually, um, a computer, for example, as one of our technologies, and I argue it's only one, has a contribution to make which is irrespective of its use as a means of implementation. For the design of a computer-based learning environment gives us a new perspective on the nature of teaching and learning and indeed on general educational objectives. And so within that, pointing to Collins' 1992 work, 
technology providing us with powerful tools, as Diana has mentioned, we may begin to develop a science of education. Um, but it cannot be an analytical science, says Collins, um, like physics or psychology, rather it must be a design science. And there we go back to the work that Diana was talking to us about in terms of a design science of education determining how different designs of learning environment contribute to learning, cooperation, and motivation. So uh, a fascinating link there is emerging in terms of the work of learning designers and the work of uh, design science of education. And within that, I argue as well, these, I won't go into the detail on this, but these are basically the trends in terms of the emergence over the last 40 years of educational technology and the evolution of the web in terms of how data is being driven. I wanted to just basically take you to the point that envisioning the future of educational technology, and we can't look at all the detail of this now, I think should look back to what John Furlong was discussing with us at BIRA, the maximization of reason and the contestation of knowledge as being amongst the areas that within educational technology, we should be looking at how education is actually one of our key concerns. That includes learning. But it also includes not just learn learners, but it includes also teachers, it includes, as Colin was saying, leaders, it includes managers, and it includes, as Diana was referring to, the systemic aspects of education, which, if you like, are necessary to improve the study and ethical practice of facilitating learning and improving performance, um, which is we, where we go back to our definition. So I argue that I think we need not entirely a rethink or a redesign, but we need to actually refresh in terms of going back to the roots of what I think was an extremely good definition at the beginning. To address the lack of criticality and the lack of scholarship, to consider the nature of an evaluative framework in terms of teaching and learning, as Diana was saying, as a whole system, and within that, to understand not just how to help teachers and learners, but to also help the entire system itself in terms of how informal learning across the world is actually encompassed in education. It is not just, as we were saying, the sitting in classrooms. It is not just what is happening today in terms of what we can conceptualize as education, but the fact that actually this field is advancing with rapidity which is extraordinary. And the way in which that, well, interesting, vital, accurate, and vibrant take-up of technologies across the world is democratizing knowledge in ways that we can hardly conceptualize. And within that, therefore, an exciting opportunity to refresh what can be, what has been sometimes possibly a, a field that needs a bit of re-looking at. But I would say that going back to it, educational technology is where the focus should remain. And to end, personally, I'd say that, now that could be controversial, but finally I want to argue that in terms of practical wisdom or phrenesis, the day-to-day -day arguing of what the field is, is important in terms of how we debate and contest knowledge and we maximize reason in the use of educational technology. Thank you.